um, globally. Uh, I'd like to invite um, uh, our first speaker to, to set the mood and, and give us an overall uh, view on how things are uh, on the internet. So, Jeff, please, would you introduce yourself and while I pull up the slides? Thanks, yes, my name is Jeff Houston. I work with AP Nick. Um, if you're not tuned to Channel 3, you should be. On the other hand, if you're not tuned to Channel 3, you won't be hearing me. So, 3, everybody, 3, Channel 3. Um, I'd like to set the scene a little bit to actually place this effort about IPv6 into some context. I often think that the period we're living through in terms of the change being introduced by this massive escalation in the computing industry coupled with a complete rebuilding of telecoms is so dramatic and so fundamental that it's only going to be our kids or even our grandkids that will really put this into perspective. Because as you live through it, some of the things that turn out to be incredibly significant are only significant years after the event itself. So to set this scene, I'd actually like to go back a bit. Um, you know, next slide, um, next slide. And, and I'd like to actually fly back 20 years. Uh, and as you might recall, 20 years ago, it was 1992. Um, if you had gone to the world telecommunications, whatever it was in 1988, you'd feel happy that you've just done some wonderful regulatory measure about the internet, about the telephone companies and so on. But the computing world, the computing world was amazing. Um, because 20 years ago, everything you're currently holding wasn't even thought of. Laptops weren't there. Back in 1992, portable computing was an Apple Mac, which didn't fit in your pocket, didn't even fit in a briefcase. This was a luggable of the worst order. Real computers, real computers were like this wonderful Vax 9000. Uh, it was meant to be water-cooled, but they couldn't make the water work. It consumed 20 kilowatts of electricity it hummed like nothing on earth, and, and it went a tremendous 125 megaflops. My iPhone has more computing capability than that machine. That was 20 years ago. So when you think of the time, the industry for the last 10 years was trying to build better mainframes, bigger mainframes, more stylish mainframes. Actually, it's a crap machine, isn't it? They failed. Um, <laughs> really is ugly. Um, but that was the idea behind it. They were just trying to build bigger pieces of ironwork. But what killed it was actually the first stage in a fantastic journey. The personal computer wasn't an instrument of scientists. It wasn't something bought by universities and corporates. It wasn't something proudly displayed in a dedicated room. It wasn't something where you had clusters of computer operators who reverently knelt down and brushed its shiny buttons. This was consumer electronics. All of a sudden, everything we ever thought about computing was thrown on its head. Because now we were in an entirely different world, a world of mass numbers, where if you didn't ship millions of computers, you're out of business. So this is one made by HP. They were a survivor. Um, this is 2002, this is 10 years ago. Um, you should never get engineers to design computers. I'm like, isn't it ugly? I'm like, if you had one of those on your desk, your desk would fall apart, it looks awful. Um, but you know, this was the state of the art 10 years ago. And you know, big thing, dominated most of your desktop. Um, ugly. Look at the next device. This is now, this is back from March of this year. Computer, fashion item. More fashion, really, isn't it? It's elegant. It's stylish. The corners are just nicely rounded, just so. The white isn't pure white, it's just slightly off. And the icons themselves are neatly rounded. Everything about this screams fashion. Not computing. Fashion. What's the size of this thing? Well, it has as much computing power as that big dinosaur mainframe of 20 years ago. It has a camera. Um, it has everything in it that you'd expect of a computer. 
except it only has two buttons. Not 300, not 104, just two. That's 20 years of evolution. So if you think about it, and there are a few of you still with your laptop out, next slide, um, <laughs> what you're tapping on is also a dinosaur because the world is moving on from even that. We are really, really are in a post-PC world that the next 10 years computing is going to shrink and move and move onward. Because I want to sort of think about where the protocols sit inside all this. So let's look at sort of the typical geek hideaway that used to be the case. Some of you might still have one of these in your study. That the way the internet used to be a destination. I used to go to work to log on. I used to have this place in my house to log on. This was a dedicated place where I used the network and having large screens, dedicated lighting, reliable power, the bandwidth came through on wires, and my chair was comfy. This isn't my office, but it could have been. It isn't your office, but it could have been. Because that's the way we thought about computing. Now, the change is just dramatic. It's massive. Because now, on your way to work, if you're in the train, you would have seen this. Where folk are just sitting there playing with their iPhones and their Androids, they're actually possibly doing their email or listening to a song or reading a book. All of a sudden, the internet is everywhere, literally everywhere, and using it is no longer a destination, it's incidental. It's just part of the fabric of our life. And the more this continues, the more it's going to disappear. I suspect that these things will be using IP in the next generation, you know, in the next year or so. But that's not all. All of this stuff is susceptible. Because now we've got the internet down to being hand-sized. We've got enormous computing down into being, it fits in my hand, it's radio, it's thumb operated. It's just something you do when you've got nothing else to do or whatever. What's a workplace anymore? Are those folk at work or going to work? Because quite frankly, you can't tell and I can't tell. And they're probably doing their email. So all of a sudden, we've changed an enormous amount of the world. And then when we start sort of counting the numbers, these are not insignificant numbers. 2.5 billion internet users is a dramatic change. But the next is kind of easy because 5 billion folk have mobile phones. And the difference between a mobile phone and an internet mobile device is just the amount of computing power you pack in. Oh, and it's got to be made by someone other than Nokia, so it's got to work. Um, but nevertheless, there are 5 billion mobile phone users. And if you look at the next one, there are currently 750 folk using these mobile handsets. Now, how old is yours? Because I can guarantee that none of them are older than six years ago, because that was when Apple first introduced this. All of those 750 million have happened in six years. It took us forever to get the first 750 million people on the internet. It's taken us six years to get the rest onto mobile right now. So where do we go? What's tomorrow's usage and user like? All of these productions are insane. Apple at one point at $700 million was the largest valued stock company in America or something. Why? Because I think most of us can see the inevitability of what is going on here. That these things, fashion items though they are, cost less than $100 to make. In fact, I'm sure with Apple's buying strength, it's probably less than $50 now. They're cheap. They're incredibly cheap. And they're incredibly ubiquitous. So if you look at these numbers in perspective and start to think, where is it going? Things get pretty frightening. Actually, so does that picture too. It's the Nullarbor in Australia. It goes on forever like that. Um, five years out from now, let's just sort of think about what that means. Already last year, we shipped 270 million of these mobile units. The cost is really low, less than $50, and Apple does not have a monopoly. Behind there is Android and Google basically pumping out a competitive product, and between it there is a rich and highly competitive market that is keeping costs down. But beyond that, you kind of look inside this, and what you see is not proprietary technology. You actually see open technology. This is Unix. So are Androids. 
an operating system developed in the early 1970s. The libraries are all open libraries. That's why these phones get hacked all the time, because the code is basically open code. Almost every part of the kernel of this system and of the Androids is actually open software. And what about the apps? Well, it's just basically the web universe of apps. There's no great specialized environment for these particular devices. So all of a sudden there's this shift away from computing being something special to computing being something incidental. And the numbers are still frightening. Look at Apple and the iPhone. Quarter 3, 2010, two years ago, they shipped 8.4 million iPhones. A year later, in one quarter, 20 million. They added 42 carriers in 15 countries in one quarter. You know, even those massive iPads were, were shipping like crazy. And then you updated a bit more, um, and quarter 4 was even bigger. You know, by quarter 4, this stuff was actually doing $46 billion in sales. So how do we fit all that together? all of those massive numbers of 37 million iPhones in a quarter, 15 million iPads, $13 billion of profit. There's one thing pretty clear, it won't fit in V4. If you look at the red curve, that in millions of units per year is a very conservative view of the demand for public addresses. It doesn't even track What's behind NATS? Currently, we're doing around 700 million new devices being connected a year, and that sort of translates into a demand for around 200 million addresses in V4. We haven't got that anymore. By 2011, we were slightly below demand. This year, the demand will be for 300 million addresses, but we've only got 100 million. Apple isn't going to stop. Google isn't going to stop. So what do we do? How do we cope with this massive overhang of demand? Um, well, we just ran out. Most of those curves that plot the amount of addresses we have, you know, just all go to the bottom. There are no more V4 addresses to cope with this. But if we look at five years out, theoretically, we would have coped with this, because in five years, something will have to happen. But we're not the telephone industry. We're not a sure bet anymore. We're now considered to be very, very high risk as an industry because we have no idea what we're doing. And a lot of the activities we're now doing have a very high risk of failure. There's now an aftermarket in V4. It's just because there are no more addresses in parts of the globe and there'll always be buyers and sellers. But quite frankly, we have no idea how that market's gonna turn out. If the price goes through the roof, we bust the network because, quite frankly, that's acute instability, lying, cheating, and stealing in addresses. Say goodbye to the network. What if the price is highly volatile? Well, why would you invest in an industry that has no certainty? Highly volatile prices also detract from any kind of meaningful investment. So we're now not the old solid telephone companies of the past. We're now no longer a rock-solid conservative industry. Oddly enough, we're high risk. This is not good. And I suspect that down below this is actually a very, very fundamental choice that the industry has to make, not in 10 years, not in 25 years that I heard this morning. That's nonsense. It's got to happen in five years. And the choice is pretty stark, and it has a lot of implications. We either get serious about V6 or do it, or we try and keep on doing what we've been doing for the past couple of years of squeezing and pushing the network into unnatural places. Everything gets squashed into HTTP, into IPv4, into carrier-grade NATs. But we don't know which way it's going to work. We have no idea what path the Internet's going to take, because these days, this is a deregulated industry. No one's in control. The determining factor is actually market forces. And the market forces that are being played out are quite large. We have seen a massive transformation of the shift of money. Google and Apple and Facebook and Amazon never existed before. And they are all quite rich companies in their own way. Content on the internet is now an extremely valuable activity. And carriage is not. 
it's a mere commodity industry where all they're doing is pushing the bits. The value is in the applications and services that sit on these computers, not in the commodity industry of bit pushing. If we make the network a constriction point, we're going to alter that balance. The carriage industry will see opportunities of blackmailing content, and you will see further struggles between carriage and content as to where the money's going to go. If we do that, we're going to break the internet badly. Because at that point, when you leave control with carriage, you're back to what the telephone companies did in the 1970s, which was nothing. They were very, very good at doing absolutely nothing. Their only innovation in 70 years was the fax. That was it. That was the only innovative product over the telephone. Why? Because if you're a monopoly incumbent, you don't have a problem. Everything you do is accepted because there's no alternative. We can rebuild that by simply squashing everything back down into a very basic model that has no flexibility. Or you can look further out, say 10 years, and go, let's just assume that within 10 years, because you don't have any longer than five, within 10 years, we're running six. If that's the case, this whole market in V4 has a very short lifetime. It's a very uh, temporary phase. The whole thing about carrier grade NATs is temporary. And indeed, there's no long aftermarket in IPv4. How many folks still run DECnet? How many folk run SNA? Apple Talk, WangNet, BurrowsNet, you know, you name it. Protocols die. When no one uses it, it just doesn't, doesn't happen. So if V6 is going to come, it's going to come within five years. And within 10 years, it's over. There is no more V4 left on the planet. Because quite frankly, if we don't do that, we're going to build a network which is going to be very, very different. Because all of those carrier grade NATs, those application level gateways, those, those uh, content distribution networks, will start vulcanizing the internet. They will start breaking it apart. Because we cannot take the next 10 years of the silicon industry and keep on producing one common platform, one common address space, one namespace. Do you realize how brittle it is? Trying to do the same thing all over the world? What's the voltage of electricity in this country? 110 volts? 240 volts? Why are they different? Does it use two vertical spades, two angle spades, two rounded prongs for electricity? Is having the switch up, off, or on? How did we get electricity so wrong? How did we manage with something as simple as electricity to never build the same thing all over this planet? Almost everyone does it differently. Having one common protocol, having one common way of formatting the bits is actually quite rare and extremely, extremely fragile because everybody wants to innovate by changing it. And as soon as you go down that track, the way you do your bits and the way you do your bits, we're not talking anymore. So quite frankly, if we can't get to V6 in 10 years, we'll be back where we were with data networking into the 1980s again, with a whole bunch of rather strange networks that don't talk to each other. That would be a shame, because I think there are better fights to have. There are much, much better fights that are much more interesting. Because I really like this device. Actually, I like this one too. But the thing is, there's no wires. It's brilliant. It just sits in my pocket. Wherever I go, the internet is with me. But for this to work, I need a whole heap of radio spectrum. And when I have two of these devices, and three and four, I'm going to need a whole heap more. And the problem with radio spectrum is that water absorbs a lot of it. There's not a lot of radio spectrum out there. And the competition for spectrum is going to be huge. And the more we want this everywhere, the more we've got to really think about how we're going to utilize that space. So I would rather we actually spend the time over the next 10 years not obsessing about why V6 is necessary. Get over that. And actually start talking about something a little bit more interesting as to how I can truly get gigabits right through the air, right to this device, because that's exciting stuff. But I started 20 years ago. Let's look 20 years to the future. Let's sort of look way out on the horizon. And I find that's almost impossible. 
I don't think in 1992 you could have sat there and said, you know, this whole thing is going to get to devices like this in your pocket. You, everyone would think you're dreaming. It just wasn't conceivable. And from where I sit now, I'm pretty sure nothing I can conceive will actually happen in 20 years. I just lack the amazing imagination. Because what we've been able to do in the last 10 years by basically using the foundations of open technologies and open standards is to build on each other's work, to stand upon each other's shoulders and develop amazing products within months by simply building on other people's work. And that idea of technology innovation through very small evolutionary steps has proved an astonishingly powerful paradigm. The world has changed for 10 years because the technology world figured out that corporate closed proprietary static systems don't work. And that if you really want a driving continuous power of innovation, openness lies right at the heart and soul and open standards sit right firmly there. If we could just figure that out and move on, we'd be so much better off. Because 20 years is hard. And interestingly, if you look back at the last 100 years, and I like this graph, and if you can pull it out from somewhere, it's well worth looking at. This is the rate of uptake of technologies in US households across the 20th century. Electricity took 60 years to be reticulated across the country. Even the humble refrigerator took 30 years. Just to get a refrigerator in everyone's house. The clothes washer, <laughs> even now there's not that many. So the things in the early part of the century took up to 40 years, 50 years, longer. But look at the last part. How long did it take for the internet to cover most of the planet? 20 years, 10 really. VCRs, much the same. Even cell phones and computers. So we're actually finding this faster and faster and faster uptake of technology. So when I look at the next few years, there's a different dynamic. 10 years, 20 years ago, what's the future of computing? Go and ask the computing industry, ask IBM, ask digital, ask the Bayamoth what their product was. What's the next 20 years? I wouldn't ask them. I wouldn't ask the telephone companies, they haven't got a clue. I wouldn't even ask Apple. I'd ask you. Because we're now in an environment where what's actually shaping the future is this idea that computing and communications is just part of consumer electronics consumer devices, that all of a sudden this truly is a post-PC world where this whole issue of computing and storage and communications is abundant. It's everywhere. So now it's all about innovation in a consumer market. And that innovation and consumer focus is where we're heading. And the innovation is all about constant technology refinement. But the assumption behind that dramatic shift is that we can continue to use open standard technologies. If we shift the internet to V6, you can expect this. You can expect a future where a profound change is going to happen, that the internet's just going to disappear. Like electricity generators, it's just going to happen. It's just going to be part of the fabric of the way we do things. Because this observation is true that the most profound technologies disappear from view. You just assume they're always there all the time. And I'd like to think that that's where we need to go. But I suspect the next five years is really critical in getting there. If we can't kick this industry into V6, it's not. Some of you come from the public sector and the regulatory sector. And you should pay close attention to this. Because realistically what we're facing is the potential for market failure. If the deregulated market does not choose this path, history will then judge us as to whether we acted appropriately in preserving a long-term public interest. If we give back the keys to our future to a set of backward-looking incumbents who are hell-bent on entrenching the position of carriage over content, you will have given away your future. And that is a market failure. The only way we can actually make this work is to make sure that addresses like computation, like communication, are abundant. That communication becomes not something regulated by the scarcity of addresses, but is actually enabled by the massive abundance of addresses. 
If you can do that, the software folk will do everything else. And they are just waiting to exercise a universe of connectivity that even now we've yet to even touch a fraction of. What we can do in software on massively powerful computers will boggle your children's mind, let alone yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, to add some um, NRO perspective on this, uh, since we manage the uh, IPv4 and IPv6 numbers, so what I can say is over the past two years, I was going over the numbers, uh, so November 1st, 2010 to November 1st, 2012, you can see dramatic uh, increase of allocation of IPv6 space. And you, if, if you look at the routing tables as well, and, and RIPE-NCC runs a very user-friendly um, graphical interface that can show you uh, per region or per country the percentage of ASNs that announce uh, uh, IPv6, you can see uh, those numbers have, uh, have doubled or maybe tripled uh, depending on the region that you're looking at. Uh, also, the NRO ran a survey um, uh, this year that it has been running for the past three years collectively as the NRO, and, and some of the stats that came out of it showed that um, out of uh, over a thousand plus uh, ISPs globally, uh, more than 50% of them that did peering peered over IPv6. Uh, over um, around 50% of them had both IPv6 internally and, exter uh, internally and externally. 20% uh, of them had uh, only externally, and 8.5 of them had it only internally. Uh, Martin, could you probably give your feedback on what you see uh, on the real world? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes, I can. Um, just and introduce you yourself, please, first. Yeah, I will introduce and you have uh, the slide I wanted. Yeah. Um, so my name is Martin Levy. I come from a company based in California called Hurricane Electric. We are a commercial company, and we are an internet service provider, an IP backbone that provides bits and connectivity around the world. We're actually an internet service provider that's considered to be a wholesale backbone. We don't provide connectivity to an end user on a cable modem or on a DSL line or over a, a, a 3G network onto a, a, a mobile device. We provide connectivity to the players that do provide that. So we sit in this concept of the core of the internet. And as a company, um, although we're about 18 or 19 years old, um, we decided about 11 years ago, this V6 thing was important. And we stood out as really being in a handful of players in the commercial side or in the um, actual business of moving bits that wanted to look at V6. It had already existed in the IETF world. It had already existed as approved standards, but now we got onto the, 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 the task of actually moving bits. So what I'm going to talk to you about is the actual practicality and show some of the numbers. Um, Absolutely everything that Jeff said, um, and I'm going to reference one thing out of it. Uh, absolutely everything that Jeff said is, 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 is front and center. Um, so I'm going to take you from, from that area to, 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 as I said, the part of moving bits. So I want to hit two, two humorous parts. First of all, I am actually in the commodity industry um, of, 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 of the carriage of bits. Um, but that's OK. Um, it's OK to be in a commodity business. Uh, if you know how to run your business plan and you know how to do it, then whether you're in a commodity or in a high margin world, um, that's your choice. Um, the other one is I was actually at Bell Labs uh, during the invention of the fax machine, actually. And, and I really wish I had a picture of the first prototype that we had, Ugly Beast, and it took up, it took up about this much of a desk um, and didn't work very well. Um, OK, um, let me uh, just hit, I, I've, I've con consolidated everything down to one slide. Uh, if we can hit the next page. Uh, one slide with five slides on it. So um, um, this, is, uh, uh, this is how politicians speak, I suppose. I'm only presenting one slide. Um, so what I have here is essentially five graphs. And these are graphs that are taken out of real world data. And each graph has the identical up and to the right picture. 
they're all graphs showing different forms of measurement of V6 in the real world over short periods of time, over long periods of time. And I'll run through them. The, the slides should be available at some point in time, but um, these are actually taken from... Um, um, these are taken from the web. They're, they're pretty much available as, as, as both raw data and as process data. So I'll run you through them, and each one will tell a story that is somewhat useful to know that V6 is real in the real world. And that is, in fact, my message, that, that we are, in fact, running in the real world with real V6 uh, bits, and that we are making the steps. Unfortunately, the percentages are not quite where they want to be. So the first graph, if we start in the top left, is simply a measure of every ASN, every separate autonomous network around the world that has turned on, in some form, IPv6. Doesn't mean they're delivering it to an end customer, but they've taken that first step of getting v6 into their network. Now, sometimes it's a very quick period of time before they start delivering it to a customer or to their customers in plural, hopefully. But in other cases, they may only implement it internally and not go any further. But it's a measure. What's interesting about this graph is that the graph meandered for many, many years. It's not worth showing the graph prior to 2008. It's pretty sad, to be honest. Um, but in 2011, February of 2011, IANA announced it was out of V4 space and that none of the RIRs after their last allocation would get any more V4 space. Something magical happened at that point. It wasn't that the technical press or the RIR meetings discussed the run out of V4, but articles showed up in the Wall Street Journal or in Bloomberg or in The Economist read by the general public, and it said something on the internet is to change. For all the years that Jeff had spent in front of a, a podium and a microphone and a laptop, for all the years I had done it, we'd got the message out, but not quite the way it happened. The run out of V4 got people interested in V6. People just waited till the last minute. The next event that happened was World V6 Day in the middle June of 2011, when a set of high visibility websites, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, and others, got together and said, for 24 hours, we're going to turn on V6, and we're going to measure if there's a problem. Because hopefully there isn't. And all of the naysayers will be silenced at that point. That's an important point, because in fact, actually, people had said, oh, we can't do this. There's problems. 24-hour test, no problems. I'll show you that graph in a second. The third event on that graph is World V6 launch, which was June of this year. I'll talk about that one in a moment. But that graph, the, the, the amount of networks that got interested in V6 and did something, made their choices based upon that, those events. And they got interested. And then after those events went away, they waned, because this is unfortunately the classic problem in life. You have to show people a deadline. You have to show people a reason to do something. You have to show people a lack of resources. So that first graph has been going up. It sits at about 14.8% today of networks around the world. That's not a great percentage, but in fact, actually, a big hunk of those are pretty important networks. So we can move on. The second graph, again, is an up and to the right. We're now on the, actually the top right side of it. Very simply, this is a, a further view into the routing table, and we see more and more people announcing V6 routes. As a percentage of V4, it's tiny. But if we equate it in some way, again, we still get down to this sort of 14, 15% number. So we're convincing the people that were easy to convince. We now have to take the message up much further. But it's happening. Now, the next, the bottom graphs are not about the routing table. They're about traffic, actual traffic on the internet. And before I talk about the graphs, there's actually two key points about traffic and IPv6 traffic that are important to point out. For every time, a connection is made over V6 versus V4. That is the movement of bits from one protocol to the other. It isn't additional traffic. It is simply the movement of traffic. The second point is, if you've moved bits from one protocol to another, that means that you better look after those bits. It doesn't matter whether it's a millionth of a percentage or 
or obviously 100%, but every bit is important. And so it is important to make sure that as V6 is deployed, even at these very low percentages that we saw many years ago, that every bit was deployed and worked properly. Because we wanted to make sure everybody's experience with V6 was a good experience. Because if it wasn't, there would be one more naysayer in the world, and that wasn't on the, on the plan to have happen. So the bottom graphs, let's go through from left to right. The left graph shows simply what happened on World V6 Day. And if the, if the graph is hard to read, I'll tell you what happened. At zero UTC, the graph went up by a factor of three and a half, instantaneously. That was the turning on of the DNS records for V6 by Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, and a bunch of other players. They ran for 24 hours. And then they turned off those quad A records, those V6 uh, address records, and the traffic went down again. But during that time, the traffic peaked 5x where it had been. The traffic actually graphed very similar to what we expect to see humans using the internet look like. They wake up, they use the internet. They get home from work, they really use the internet at that point in time. And about 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, they finally stop. That's when the teenagers go to sleep. Uh, if you've got a teenager, you know they don't actually go to sleep early. Um, they, they don't wake up early either. Um, so the graph went up and down, and we were pretty certain, yeah, this was humans. But more importantly, during that 24-hour period, very few complaints. In fact, very hard to find people who had issues connecting to the Internet. Their Google still worked. Their Facebook still worked. Their, their Yahoo, their Microsoft, etc., still worked. Yeah, uh, Google, uh, Google decided that their YouTube video could stay as a V6 deliverable. And so the graph didn't go back to where it was. It actually stayed up about two and a half to three times the bandwidth. And that gave us real traffic to look at from that point onwards. This was a good thing. This shows faith in V6. Again, we're, we were zeroing in on those naysayers and saying, your time has come. We are moving real traffic. Of course, this is still an amazingly small percentage of the rest of the Internet traffic. But we were looking after it, we were taking care of it, and it was a good thing. The middle graph is sort of a two-year view. And, and the detail on this is actually um, quite interesting. First of all, two years before um, this graph was done in about July of, uh, of this year, of 2012, um, uh, two years ago, not the only thing that was really running of any uh, substance was ipv6.google.com with a few of the map um, uh, application turned on, the images behind maps, but it generated the traffic. World V6 Day showed the jump. And then for the next 12 months, as World V6 launch was um, um, marketed to the rest of the internet community, what happened was that launch was a different event than day. It, in it said, be ready by this day. Don't turn it on by that day. Just be ready a month, two months, three months beforehand. We've proven that V6 is actually going to work in the real world for this. And so as the day approached, we saw the graph go up. It goes up in, in step functions as more bits of Google or Netflix or Microsoft or Facebook turn into V6, one data center after another data center, one CDN portion after another CDN portion, bits of Akamai or Limelight turning up for V6. And by the time we get to World V6 launch, um, the 6th of July of 2012, in fact, actually, we're pretty happy with, uh, with everything that's, uh, that, that's going along here. And, and, and quite frankly, um, there aren't any complaints out there. And this is good. So we had really taken a big step forward as a community um, where we couldn't have had this story a year ago. We absolutely could not have had this story three or four years ago. We're in a different position. The final graph is sort of an insight into um, some of the internet peering, some of the infrastructure that, that operates the internet. Um, it shows a problem and a solution, and that's actually rather good. But again, they're up and to the right graphs. The yellow graph is the German internet exchange in Frankfurt, the DKIX exchange. And it has been steadily growing from before July. Uh, this is a very much a, a zoomed out, multi-year graph, so everything gets averaged out. But there's a little peak in about uh, the beginning of June, uh, just before World V6 launch, where about 20 gigabits of uh, V6 traffic suddenly shows up in, in Frankfurt. And we all go, ooh, this is good. This means there's really V6 traffic out there. Then it disappears. 
And when traffic goes away, that actually worries engineers far more than when traffic shows up. So the question is, why did it go away? And it turned out, when you finally looked at it, what it was was it was some routing that hadn't been finely tuned. There was traffic going from uh, a large uh, content provider into the country, into a, a particular provider in Romania via Frankfurt, which was a perfectly acceptable path. But instead of going over what are called private uh, peering uh, connections, fiber connections between two providers, it was going over a public, um, uh, going over a public uh, platform, which actually meant it was completely measurable. So we got to see it. This is a lot of traffic. It turns out these uh, guys in Romania had done the other half of the problem of content. They'd said about a year or so ago, we've got millions of eyeballs here in Romania, and we own all of the customer premise equipment, the routers that sit at the, at the premise for the, uh, of, of their subscribers. We'll throw V6 into that software mix, and we'll, we'll, we'll add V6 to our offering. By the way, they didn't tell their millions of users. They actually didn't need to. We knew that from World V6 Day. So they did their testing, and they'd rolled it out by this point in time over a million users, far eclipsing any other provider anywhere in Europe, Asia, or the US. Interestingly enough, AT&T has done the same thing in the US and now is shipping even more traffic to their customer base as they have rolled out new software. And that final point may actually be the most interesting thing about V6. Because if we're lucky, what we're going to do with our, with our work, both at the bit level and at the higher levels of V6, is deploy the rest of the IPv6 um, uh, to uh, deploy IPv6 to the rest of, the, of the, the user community, and they may never notice. It isn't up to my mother to know what IPv6 is. Actually, my mother knows what IPv6 is because she knows what I do. But the reality is that the end user just wants access to the internet. And there's sort of a full stop at the end of that word, the internet. And whether it's V4 or V6, they just want their their, their computers, their access, their iPads, their TVs, their whatever, to be able to access the internet. And this data pretty much shows that, that to a certain extent, the internal industry, the industry of moving bits around the world, the commodity industry, as, uh, uh, as Jeff points out, is type kind of doing its bit. And obviously, we'll do a lot more. These graphs do continue to go up and to the right. And that's what I wanted to share today. It's a good story. It's a positive story. And that's where I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, for that. Um, also, I'd like to add some more facts of what we can see uh, globally. So when it comes to CCTLDs, out of the 248 CCTLDs out there, uh, 152 of them have IPv6 on them. Uh, out of the 20 current GTLDs deployed, uh, 15 of them have IPv6. And in the new GTLD process by ICANN, I'm sure you, you attended the, the session this morning and you know of the process, IPv6 is a requirement in applying for one of those new GTLDs. Uh, nine out of the 13 named servers also support IPv6. All, server, uh, all reverse root name servers that are managed by the RIRs all support native IPv6. Um, you can find all this information and more from the surveys that I'm, 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 I'm mentioning on the NRO website. Um, so uh, I, I'd like to mention one, also another bit of what we found in the, the survey before going to uh, Dimi, my, um, my third uh, speaker, uh, which is uh, the question was, what are the biggest hurdles that you face while deploying IPv6? Uh, and in order there were vendor supports, knowledge, know-how within staff, costs, business case for non-techs, and uh, information security. Uh, so I'm hoping Demi could actually uh, expand more from the, the, the case that he sees uh, in Brazil and gave us more information, please, Demi. OK. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much for being in this very exciting panel. It will be very hard to make any delivery, for any presentation after the two brilliant presentations we've just had. Uh, <coughs> anyway, oh, I, I, I'm, I, I have some slides. Can, can, can I? No, okay. Ah, okay. My name is Demi Gechko. I work for the Brazilian Network Information Center. I, I, I am an, an obsolete engineer, but 
anyway, uh, I, I following. I am following the, the process of uh, deploying and, and fostering IPv6 uh, in Brazil. Next slide. J just very briefly, uh, the Brazilian NIC is an uh, executive arm of the Brazilian Steering Committee. We get our money with uh, registering uh, domains under .br, and we use this money to make in all other activities. For example, statistics and uh, uh, running the CERT, the Brazilian CERT, and having uh, also exchange points, uh, tw 22 exchange points uh, in the whole country. It's a quite big country. And one of the activities is to, to have training and uh, uh, dissemination of IPv6 in, in some way. It's part of the SEPTO.br. It's uh, in the, the bottom of this slide. Okay, next one. Just repeating some of the points we, we have heard uh, very brilliantly in this, this afternoon, we, we have to have in mind that uh, uh, the Internet is based in end-to-end -end communication. Then if we can preserve this feature, it will be very good for the Internet and for us. Uh, this is just a, a preamble to that we were saying something about uh, NATs and uh, n n network uh, trans address translation. That in some way can ha ha hurt the principle of end-to-end -end communication. The second principle that it's very important to, to keep and to strength is that the, the network uh, can evolve and can escalate because it's very simple in, in its core. The core of internet just deliver packets from one side to another. We cannot uh, burden the, the core of the internet with a lot of strenuous thing and, uh, uh, and uh, complexities. We have to, to keep the complexities at, at the borders of the net, at the outer part of the net. And this is one of other things we have to have in mind all the time. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, just to, to <coughs> re reaffirm this, IPv6 is an old thing. IPv6 began in 94 and uh, complete the, the first uh, description and, uh, in, in 98, then we have 14 years of IPv6. Then the argument that this is a new thing that I'm not aware of is clearly a, a, a false argument. If the things were as uh, it was minded in the beginning, we after a, a short uh, transition time, all the, the users and all the devices in the internet have trans transited from, uh, will have transited from IPv4 to IPv6 and then we can uh, calmly and uh, peacefully switch off the IPv6, uh, IPv4, and keep all the things running in IPv6. But unfortunately, next slide, please. The thing, uh, uh, the, the things didn't happen this way. Uh, maybe the people stay in their comfort zone. No one take care of making the uh, uh, beginning of, of depletion of IPv6. Then we have now a, a, a much harder situation because we don't have IPv4 uh, in quantity to make this calm and peaceful transition to IPv6, and we have to deliver some kind of, of, of transition techniques that can allow us to, to make the, the transition to IPv6. Uh, this transition involves uh, some way of sharing IPv4 probably using port numbers, probably using other other techniques. And all these techniques has this good and bad side, uh, as we can try to, to show. Next one, please. Uh, for, for the user perspective, uh, as Martin said very clearly, the user don't mind if uh, you, uh, it's using IPv4 or IPv6. Then if a user c c comes with, with IPv4, and access services in IPv4, it's all right, it's working well, no problems at all. If comes with IPv4 and access services uh, that uh, is implemented in dual stack, like Google, Facebook, uh, YouTube, and so, also no problem, they will be working quite well, no problems at all. But if, if we are running out of numbers and we begin to, to, to give IPv6 numbers to the new users, to newcomers to the network, these new users will come to the network with IPv6 labels, IPv6 protocol, 
and they can of course access the dual stack services like IPv6, IPv4, but they cannot access services that has not migrated to dual stack or uh, uh, that uh, are only in IPv4 land. Then this is the problem with the, the red arrow in the, the slide. Uh, more crucial right now, we, we have to convince the, the services providers that is running their services in IPv4 that they have to use the dual stack approach because otherwise this part of the internet, that's a big part of the internet, will not be available for the new users that came with uh, IPv6. Next slide, please. Other challenges, uh, uh, more or less in the, the same line, uh, not all, all equipment supports IPv6. We have to, to check different uh, transition techniques. The dual stack is uh, the, the cleaner and the most uh, adequate, but uh, there may be some problems on that. Uh, a controversial technique that the, the carriers are trying to use is the, the double, double net. And uh, there are other techniques, and of course, many of them use the, the IP4 sharing. Next, next, please. I will not enter in details of what is the double net, but uh, if you, uh, maybe you can see in this slide, if a user come from, from, the, from the left, uh, left side using IPv6, you have to convert to an IPv4 and give another IPv4, a, a fake IPv4, maybe with some port number added, to, to go to the IPv4 wor world. Uh, if you are with IPv6 and, and, and say aiming to go to IPv6 internet, no problems at all, but uh, maybe you have to face this dual net and this dual translation of addresses inside your provider. Next slide, please. What is the problem with this double net? First, uh, in some way, he don't foster, don't foster the IPv6 deployment because they say, okay, we are uh, okay with this double net. We have uh, sufficient IPv4 with port numbers, this uh, thousand times the number we, we need. We, we, can, we can keep this going on. Uh, in some way, this double net breaks the end-to-end -end model. That's very bad for, for, for us. The, it breaks also the simple uh, core principle and delivers a bad user experience, uh, probably. Uh, other, other aspects related to the double NAT is that uh, it requires some investment, some equipment, and some hardware. And this high investment ten, tends to perpetu uh, perpetuate it itself. Then it, it will be a, 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 a way to delay. Uh, it's a bad way to delay the, the IPv6 deployment. And another side consideration is if you, if you go to double NAT, all the telco operators will have all your URLs, all your uh, navigation uh, in, in an automatic way because th they have to have uh, the, the, the NAT uh, inside the, the uh, premises. Then uh, this can violate the user's privacy also. Next slide, please. Then wha what we are trying to do in Brazil, of course, we are trying to, to foster the IPv6 deployment. The first wave is to, to convince the transit operators and vendors to have in, in their shelf the option of IPv6. The second, is to, to, the second wave is to convince the content providers, web and then email providers, so that they have to offer the dual stack thing in IPv4 and IPv6, if po possible. And the third is to discuss with access providers what will be the best uh, transition technique we can uh, devise or can offer not to, to fall in the pitfalls of, of some of them. Next, please. Okay, we at uh, NICBR are, are doing some uh, uh, training, free training. We have uh, trained more than 2,000 professionals in this, in this area. We, we have some free IPv6 transit just to make some experiments. This free uh, IPv6 transit is offered at the, uh, the Sao Paulo uh, exchange point. It's the biggest exchange point in the country with a peak of uh, 120 giga, more or less. Of course, uh, the IPv6 transit is uh, 200 mega, not, not one, one, 100 giga, but anyway, it's, it's growing. Uh, we have a, a, a more or less 45 autonomous system exchanging traffic in IPv6 in, in, in our uh, IXP, uh, there are big autonomous systems, no, not small users. 
and we participate in, in IPv6 for another thing. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, we, we, we developed a site. This is a site of uh, uh, IPv6.br. There's a lot of information, how many uh, assignments we have done until now, how is the depletion of IPv4, and so you can go to this site and get some information. Next one, please. We also developed a piece of software that's quite interesting. There, there are other versions of this, but it's open also if you want to try it. It's a, a validator that uh, tests uh, 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 address, you put a URL uh, there, and tests all, all, all the three uh, uh, possibilities of being compa totally compatible with IPv6 or just partially compatible with, with uh, DNS compatible and the other parts not compatible. So then you can try to validate uh, any site you want to, to test if the site is ready uh, for IPv6 or, or is not uh, ready yet. Next, please. This is the, the, the e learning we have uh, available also on the site. It's for free. You can use it and maybe disseminate also the, the course. Uh, uh, it's just in Portuguese and Spanish, but we will try to put in English also. But uh, right now it's just in the available in, in Portuguese and Spanish. Next one, please. Th this is a slide that say that we are doing some courses and capacity building. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, uh, this is the IPv6 week. As I said, we, we took part of the, this experiment, the world experiment, to try to set up uh, services in a, in a steady way using IPv6. And we, we really saw a peak of, of using IPv6 in, in that, that week and that, that day, also in Sao Paulo and Brazil. Uh, the people participate on that. We have convinced many, many uh, content providers that it, it is important to, to, to be uh, working in dual stack and they keep the services also in IPv6 since now, then we have some, some peaks on that. Next slide, please. Uh, we, we are trying to make another, uh, th th this is a thing we, we did in the uh, campus party, it's an event in Brazil, in this year, in February. Uh, we, 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 there is a lot of, of young people uh, assembled here and they spend a whole way a week together and we, we put native IPv6 in all the party and the people developed things using native uh, IPv6. It was a, a good way to, to aware the younger uh, hackers to be on. Next, next please. Th this is the people that was in that event. No, not important. Ne next one, please. And uh, next one, please. Okay, this is the, the, the course resulted from the, these events. Uh, as you can see, th there is a grow of the traffic, not a, a big grow, but anyway, it's, it's important. And it's r directly related to the events. The regional IPv6 week was the source of one of peak, and uh, the IPv6 world, uh, world la launch was the other peak on the graph. Next one, please. Uh, this is also a, a graphic showing the number of websites uh, ending in .br with IPv6 support. Uh, it's, it's listed in Alexa, uh, one million top side lists. And uh, you see also the same uh, event, the regional IPv6 week and the world IPv6 launch is, is, is responsible for the slope on the graphic. Next one, please. This is uh, just a table of allocation on IPv6 in Brazil. Uh, as you see, the, the, the slope is going uh, faster now. We are quite optimistic that we will have good uh, dissemination of this, but we are quite, quite behind the IPv4, of course. Next one. Okay, this is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dimi. Uh, unfortunately, we had two cancellations from our panelists uh, today, so I will cover quickly the two topics that they uh, we're going to call, uh, ta uh, talk about which were capacity building and interacting with decision makers and, 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 and governmental officials. And I'll bring also the NRO perspective on this. So in terms of capacity building, especially technical capacity building, uh, the RIRs are heavily engaged in this. Uh, we, we, we do trainings at our two, uh, 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 at our face-to-face -face meetings. Each of the RIR does this. We're heavily involved with the different NOGs 
Brussels in all the different regions and, and, and we, we try to take the, the experiences and, and the best uh, uh, practices that we learn all over the globe and try to deliver them uh, in these technical trainings. Um, there are a bunch of road shows um, uh, that, that, that are done as well, RIP NCC, Erin do their uh, uh, road shows, uh, AFRINEC uh, uh, does the, the technical trainings, hands-on technical trainings along with EPINEC as well. Uh, all the RIRs, uh, LACNIC, all of the RIRs are heavily involved in, in, in getting that technical message across. Uh, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in person. So uh, some of our like uh, LACNIC and, and AFRINIC do uh, webinars. So uh, I you can dial in from wherever you are and, and get the knowledge of what IPv6, uh, whatever t IPv6 topic is, is being dealt with, whether it's technical or non-technical. Um, on, on the decision maker part, each one of the RIR also runs an, an IPv6 for deci decision maker tracks. And, and, and this is something that we, we, we found is very uh, instrumental because uh, for uh, a lot of the decision makers that are currently uh, addressing some of the major issues within their uh, economies or nations, uh, they, they, f uh, they focus on uh, some of the development in the ICT world, uh, but they still do not uh, see IPv6 uh, as a main course. They still treat this as a sideshow. However, when you go to them and discuss, for example, uh, so one of the topics is uh, there is no cutting date, uh, cutting off date for IPv4 to IPv6 transition. However, they are discussing uh, discussing now cut off uh, the cutoff date for analog to digital uh, television. So when you go to them and tell them, how are you going to build your networks? Using IPv4 or IPv6, what are you going to invest in now? You actually find heads turning. You actually find things clicking and, and, and making sense. And this is some of the, the, the messages that we tried to, to push through these uh, IPv6 for decision maker uh, sessions that we do. Also, there are a lot of uh, outreach to not only ISPs, but also other uh, um, networks that, are, uh, that have uh, presence on the internet, let's say, like uh, mobile internet, for example. Uh, in, in regions like mine, in Africa, uh, mobile internet is, is the biggest thing. The people are not looking into deploying that much into a fixed infrastructure and are going directly to mobile networks because, as, as Jeff mentioned, it's, it's the next thing. And, and we have the luxury in, in regions like Africa of not having those big ne luxury ne uh, legacy networks. So we, we do trainings on LTE over IPv6 and so on and so forth. Uh, this is some of the stuff, the activities that, that we do as NRO to, to try to increase that. I'd like to now to, to open the, and, and one last thing, and I'd actually, yes, I'll have, Mark, I was just going to call out on you. One of the things that was mentioned was um, equipment, vendor support. And I know you ran the IPv6 uh, CPE readiness uh, survey, so if you can expand on that before we go open the mic for questions, please. Yes, thank you, uh, Hisham. Uh, I was gonna do go there anyway. Uh, full disclosure: uh, My name is Mark Hoogewoning. I work for the RIPE NCC. RIPE, as regional in uh, internet registry, is also part of the NRO. Uh, I'm also one of the co-chairs of the RIPE IPv6 working group, uh, which is set forth by the technical community to uh, basically share it with everything that has to do with IPv6 deployment. And in my previous life as an engineer, I'm responsible for rough guess probably 90% of the IPv6 users in the Netherlands uh, right now. Um, that's uh, one of the networks I did. Uh, as you mentioned, yes, CP and CP was a problem, and well, people keep telling me still is a problem. Uh, one of the activities we've undertaken, and we did that already in 2009 roughly, is the so-called IPv6 CPE survey. Uh, by basically looking, and, and, and that focus started in Europe, so it primarily focuses right now on, on DSL and cable networks and, and FTTC. The basic complaint of people, we can't get end-user devices, cheap end-user devices that do IPv6. Uh, 
in 2009 we already proven that there were some out there. Um, we recently did another run, uh, the 2012 edition is now out, uh, we're still collecting feedback from other vendors. I think right now um, our list contains slightly over 75 different models from 8 different manufacturers uh, that all out of the box support IPv6. Yet, almost on a daily basis, people tell me, oh, I can't do IPv6 because I don't have IPv6 EP. Uh, so, at that point, I think it's no longer that the CP is not available, it's the willingness to invest in new customer premises equipment by the operators that already have an install base. And as you said, it's, it's, it's for Africa, for instance, it's slightly different because you've got a lot of greenfield deployments and a lot of new users. Uh, we're now looking especially in the European market where everything is pretty much saturated, internet penetration rates are over 90%, and it's a huge investment to replace existing equipment. And that becomes a challenge. Uh, which, if I may, brings me to the point I was trying to make, and unfortunately uh, connectivity died, so I can't check the real numbers. But to my knowledge, out top of my head, uh, it, within the RIPE NCC we have about 8,500 members, and slightly over 50% of them have an IPv6 allocation. Now if we start looking at routability, if we start looking at how many of those networks we actually see on the internet, we get much less. We're looking at 15 17 percent of the networks that actually support IPv6. If you look one step further, and that's the point Jeff was, I think, making, is that that's the core of the network. And deploying the core of the network is not enough. Of course you need network support to deploy IPv6. But what really is important, and that's in the end what's driving it, are what the operators call the eyeballs, the user at home. And as Jeff said, it's all about the device in your hand. And as long as that device in your hand doesn't have IPv6 connectivity, whether supported or not, and if you get a new iPhone, it will support IPv6. The latest iPhone does support IPv6. The latest Androids do support IPv6. The lack is in the network. Um, which brings me to the question to the panel is, whose responsibility is that? And in moving forward, uh, in terms of regulation, should there be more pressure on the network operators to push that down to the market. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Marco. Uh, do we have any questions from the remote participants? Nothing yet. Do we have any questions from the floor? Yeah. Yes, Adam, up here. My name is Norbert Bollo from the Swiss Open Systems User Group. So part of what we do is um, advocacy, lobbying, and I've been wondering for years, should we try to push our national government regulator to do something to pro pro promote the transition? Is it perhaps too early? Like if we push a lot now that uh, somehow the momentum is too hard to build and if we push a lot now then maybe later we've already shot our ammunition so what I would like to ask especially in view of this risk that obviously is there that we've been aware of for years um, where is the point that should we should watch for where we see or should see should realize now if our government doesn't really take action we are going down the wrong direction. So where's the point where we really need to mobilize everything we have to go all out for advocacy? Yeah, Jeff, if you want to take it. Yeah. Um, both of those are actually fascinating public regulatory questions and they go straight to the heart of the regulatory function. Because what you're really saying is, is this a case of market failure? is a market-based distribution, if you regard the transition to V6 as a market function, is the market actually functioning efficiently? Are there competitive pressures out there that are driving providers to provide V6 service? And the experience that we're living through says, this is amazing. 
both in Asia Pacific and now in Europe and the Middle East, we've run out of V4 addresses. We naively thought that the industry would react to that run out and actually do something. And all we see is more carrier grade NAT. So I'm beginning to think to myself that a case can be made that this is a market failure. That in particular the last mile carriage operators are not acting in the larger interest and are actually taking a convenient left turn that satisfies their own interest at the expense of everything and everybody else. What can you do in a public sector form? The US government, the Australian government, um, I can probably think of a few others but I don't track them very closely, did the first thing. They said to all of their public agencies and all of their functions of government that are performed over the net, you've got to do this in V6. And they set target dates and some of them have slipped and some of them are still a few months out. But interestingly, you know, in a lot of these economies, the public sector is large. And if you include every school, every high school, every university, the public sector is indeed a large buying force. Don't forget the internet started in the public sector as a research activity. And the theory goes that if you get the public sector doing this, you actually drive the commercial providers, because the public sector is provided by commercial providers, into providing V6 services. But I'm not sure that's everything because it's not the problem of the backbones. If I can get a V6 packet into people's backbones, I can get it around the world right now and so can you. That's not hard. It's the last mile. It's that access network in DSL. It's that 4G network that they're busy putting out 4G systems and Verizon's gone, yes, all of ours is V6, but so many other operators are putting V4 behind carrier grade NAT over their LTE. I kind of think that mobile services are everything. In terms of revenue per user, in terms of margin per user, mobile is where the money is. And if mobiles move to six, services and content are just there hanging around with their tongues, you know, their mouth open, because that's where the money is. And if we actually manage to get 4G networks to move quickly, the rest will, I think, follow. Some of the 4G providers are, many are not. And if I was sitting in the regulatory seat right now going, where can I apply just a tiny bit of incentive and pressure? I think I'd look at 4G network rollouts and go, can you do something? And what would it take to get you motivated to do something? The handsets, as Marco has pointed out, and handset rollover is high. Every two years you buy a new one. The handsets are now doing V6 in the radio doing V6 on Wi-Fi. The handsets are ready. It's now the base stations and the operators. And I think I'd apply pressure there and then clean up the wired network second. But that would be my view. Maybe Martin has a different approach. You know, every little bit helps. Um, I'm always heartened when I see um, one more bit of the network move, uh, move over. But... Um, Go back to the core of the question is, uh, you know, should you engage the public sector now, later? Should you have done it two years ago, four years ago, or yesterday? Um, I'm just going to go back and talk about that part um, and, and just say, take it as a... Um, um, Take it as a task. It never hurts to have the conversation. Um, and it never hurts to have the answer be, yeah, we know about this. Don't, don't bother us. We, we've got it on our schedule because you can come back and ask again. <clears throat> or you can go to, um, or you, if you hear the answer, sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. Ah, that's the perfect opening. That, 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 that gives you opportunity. So go for it. Um, Shouldn't be too complicated in a place like Switzerland. Was that a naive statement? I, I, I'll give it a try. Um, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Um, you know, Switzerland in this thing is a banana republic. Um, we have it in theory. I'm on the committee that makes the rule for the government, and 
essentially the government is obligated to do it, but they don't do it. Yeah. Just, just to add also two cents on that, I suppose one of the things that the government can do is to, to buy equipment and to, to put all the government structure uh, compatible with IPv6. Because, uh, as we know, the, 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 the t s t s uh, time cycle for this kind of equipment is quite short. In, in three, or three or four years, all the routers will be IPv6 compatible. Uh, I agree the problem is will be the last mile, because in the last mile you have some small equipment and in, in very numerous equipment. It will be much more hard to, to try to, to change it. But my, my worries is, is a little bit different. It's, uh, if we go forward with this uh, carrier grade net and other kind of solutions uh, between codes, maybe this can entrench the problem and delay yet more the, the transition. Then this is a question I put to the table also and ask advice for uh, our panelists here. If there is alternatives to, to carrier grade net, we can, we can use to avoid this kind of pitfall. You know, the attempts at, by both the US government and by the European Union to pull Microsoft's obvious monopoly apart were pitiful. They were pitiful in their ineffectuality. Just nothing happened. What pulled Microsoft's monopoly apart? Google. What was Google? Google was innovation. Google was doing the same thing differently. And the reason why Google was actually able to thrive as a business was that the network was open. They needed nobody's permission. It was a web site that just worked. But what if you have a network that's closed? What if you have a network that it's hard to reach unless you're running a content distribution network, unless you've got multiple millions of dollars out there in deployed infrastructure, unless you're already big, you can't get anywhere. What happens then? Because at some point we're going to look at the current monopolists of content, the behemoths of content, and go, hang on, you're a bit big. There's a regulatory problem going on in your behaviour. And we're going to face yet another problem, as we did with Microsoft, but this time, if we close up the network, if we say, look, innovation's over, I'm sorry, you're going to need permission to run a new application because all the middleware in the world that we've now stuffed in to make V4 work doesn't let your new idea run. Sorry. Then all of a sudden, you're going to find monopolies out there in computing, information and data that individual governments are going to be powerless to deal with. And I suspect that even the EU and the combined regional governments are going to sit there and go, well, that's a bit of a problem. I wonder what we're going to do. So we can sit here and bemoan the fact that we're not actually embracing openness and what should we do and let the next five years roll on. When you look back in five years' time, you'll find you're already in a very dark place. It's such a dark place that the folk who are closing up the network have no incentive to open it up again. And the innovators who could have done something have long since gone into biogenetics or some other field of endeavour because this field would have shut up its shop. So, you know, the choice is here and now, and the choice is actually a very, very big choice and a very dramatic choice. It's actually about what kind of network do you want for the next 10 years? Because if you really want openness, if you really want innovation, if you really want a good idea to become an application in a week, if you really want folk to think, God, I can make a career out of this, if you want that, you need to act now. And you actually need to paint into the public regulatory area the issue that we're playing with very, very big forces now. That that coincidence of computing and communication is now unleashing a very powerful social force. And what we need is a constant overview that keeps it open. I can't keep it open in V4, and you can't either. If we start stuffing this with application devices and middleware, this is not a permissionless network. It's a permission-ridden network. And permission means payment. The incumbents win, everyone else loses. I'm not sure that's why we're here. Certainly why I'm, not why I'm here. I'd rather think that we can actually persuade folk that this is what is required. I do believe it's a market failure. I do believe that like digital set-top boxes actually had public sector intervention that the force from analogue to digital television signalling did include public measures. 
I think we've got to go and look at the CPE and actually allow folk to exchange their CPE for something that does six. For God's sake, the boxes only cost 50 bucks. This is easy. Stop making a mountain out of what should be a relatively minor molehill. We can just go and ream through the CPE. And if that's the case, all those last mile access providers have nothing to whinge about. It's just a case of doing it. And I'd suggest do it now. Don't wait for a year. Do it now. I'm just going to give it um, a much more... I mean, <laughs> yes. The consumer has always proven that it can vote with its wallet. So I live in a town and I have a cable TV provider and I have a, um, um, a, a DSL provider or actually now a uh, fiber to the curb plus DSL provider. And I have uh, contacted, because one of the nice things about being in this industry is you get to know the, 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 the individual engineers. And you said, hey, you know, here's my zip code in the U.S. Don't install a carrier-grade NAT in that city. I've said it. Now, I have an in. I admit it. Um, it probably has no effect whatsoever. But the reality is that I don't want to live in that world. Now, I, have a, I actually have a cable TV provider with a cable modem uh, offering that runs V6. So I'm, I'm right up there in, 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 in a pretty happy land, to be honest. Um, but the consumer will vote because if it turns out the other provider has a better service, more importantly, if the teenage son realizes that um, playing with the Xbox 360 is not quite as snappy at his house versus his buddy's house, and they've got different providers, they're going to turn around and say, Mom, Dad, we need to swap. It'll work better if we go to this other provider. And if the issue is carrier-grade NAT, one of the things that may happen pretty quickly is people realize that this V6 thing isn't such a bad idea after all, and they should do it. So I, I still have faith in the consumer and its wallet. Could I just take Mark's question first? Mark and then Marco. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Elkins. I live at the far end of Africa, and I happen to run an ISP. And for the last five years, I've been running IPv6, and I have IPv6 at home. And I was wondering why I don't have IPv6 at this uh, convention at the moment. Ditto. We, we have actually tested Azerbaijan using a client-based testing mechanism embedded in an online ad. So I can say pretty accurately that Romania is looking at around, I think it's 20% or so. Um, there are some countries that have an awful lot of V6. And there are some where we get absolutely no V6 response at all. And we've tested quite a number of folk who are in Azerbaijan or networks that claim to be here. And we've yet to see an IPv6 packet from them. So if this conference did have V6, it's possibly a first. Yes, now I am. Uh, response to Martin. Uh, permission to, de to disagree with you. Uh, I've been around and then we've been traveling on the same circus now for, for a couple of years. Um, yes, eventually the consumer will vote with his feet. Or will he? Because by the time he's up to the point that he's voting with his feet, people already broke the network. Now, in a situation where you still have newcomers, in a situation where you still have pioneers that are capable of doing some inventive work, the next generation Googles, you might have a pioneering network that actually provides that better service. But what if that market is locked up between an incumbent and two other very big market players, and all three of them break the network equally hard? That customer does not have a choice. And that's the situation Jeff is painting the big networks and 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 i come from a country where you can roughly say that the market is divided by three or four big players if all four of them install a carrier grade net all four of them break the network and the consumer doesn't know what happened because his neighbor's network is equally bad this is um a hard this is a hard conference to me for me to be at I'm very much about the moving of bits and very little about policy. 
but you've you've hit on something that you know in that type of scenario I, I, I it's one of the few times I'll say hey somebody should phone the regulator and uh, and, and, and and do something that's 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 where I change my 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 tone but prior to that I, I I'm still a pretty positive type kind of guy I still think the consumer has some pull I think so before taking Paul's question, I, I just want to run a quick survey in the room. How many people in the room have IPv6 in their workplace? Okay, fair enough. H how many have them at home? Okay. Oh. Sorry, how many of them have? Have never heard of IPv6 before. Okay, yeah. Paul, please ask your question. Thank you. Hello, uh, Paul Vixie, Aaron Board of Trustees. Um, Jeff had a great slide that showed uh, two paths in a park, uh, and I was asking the question, which path will we take? Uh, history says we will take both paths. Um, and with regard to breaking the network, um, I've been engaged in trying to deliver new DNS services, new DNS functionalities uh, for about most of the last 20 years. And I can tell you that none of them work in most coffee shops or hotel rooms because uh, some idiot middle box vendor got there ahead of me and decided in advance what a DNS packet would have to look like. And it is very difficult to add things like IPv6 support or DNS security support to a network that, uh, where the first mover advantage was a plastic box manufacturer in Taiwan who decided a long time ago that what you wanted to do should not work. So um, I know that all of that CGN stuff is going to get done. People are going to bet that way. Um, th we all know that they're going to lose. Uh, so we know that in the end, one path works, one path doesn't. But uh, Please let's remember that the brokenness is happening now. Uh, the brokenness is going to happen. We are all going to pay the combined price of the people who bet the wrong way. Uh, but I, I, I very much echo what Jeff has said here. Uh, we, we need to look to the future. And the future probably makes all carriage into a commodity and not a value-added service. Thank you. Thank you. At this point, I'd like to ask for um, closing remarks from my panelists. So, Jeff, Martin, then Demi, please. Um, I'm honestly not sure what else there is to say. This is not an argument about technology. It's actually an argument about openness. And what we're finding is that the industry does not move with one common motivation, that we're actually many parts. There are folk who do content. There are folk who make equipment. There are folk who do carriage. There's consumers, there's folk who make consumer devices. And we're finding the motivations for shift in the technology, for investment in V6, varies depending on whom you are and where you see your own self-interest. The amazing fact right now is that almost every single one of these PCs that are dinosaurs have V6 in the stack and it's active. These days, as long as you trade in your iPhone for a new one, you'll have V6 on the radio and V6 on the LAN. Within a year, I think I could say quite confidently that almost everything out there in device land is capable. Amazing achievement. And I can shift stuff around the world. Amazing achievement. But that last mile is killing me. And I really don't understand how to move that last mile carriage industry to simply get a clue in the mass market and actually just move on and deploy. And that's why I'm thinking maybe a word with the regulator is now time. Like the analog to digital set top box issue, we're now facing a wedging of this market, and that may well be a market failure that's going to require some form of light intervention that just focuses their attention slightly differently. I just don't like the regulator part <laughs> of that. <laughs> I'll introduce you to some... Just to, to push in a little bit of the memory, I remember uh, the, the operators in, in 80s or something like that are committed to ISO-OSI stack 
and they changed their mind, not, not because of the regulators, I suppose, because the regulators are also all, all behind the, the uh, ISO, ISO thing. Then maybe we, we can convince the, the market and the, the, the people that are involved on that, that there are really clean solutions and we have to go forward keeping the internet open and end to end and with the core simple. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for attending the session and for more information about what the RIRs are doing within your region or what the NRO in, in general is doing, please we have a booth, please come see us, you, you can get when the next meetings are, you can get more information from your RIR about what's happening in your country. Thank you very much.